evening, everyone. Um, I have a koan for you today. Um, you know, koans are a, bit, a thing that's very peculiar to Zen Buddhism. Uh, there are teaching stories in Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, the Sufis have some very nice teaching stories. And of course, the Bible has lots of them. But uh, uh, in Zen, we use these teaching stories in a more formalized way. And over the centuries, other little addenda have been adding to, added to the original story. Uh, sometimes a commentary, sometimes a poem, sometimes both. So uh, the koan I have for you today is called Senjo and Her Soul Are Separated. This is case 35 of the Mumin Khan, and this also appears, the same koan appears again in the Blue Cliff Record. So we know that two uh, accomplished teachers have thought this koan important enough so that they have saved it for posterity uh, and uh, commented upon it. So here is the, the koan. Goso asked a student, Senjo and her soul are separated, which is the real Senjo. <coughs> so um, it's Muman, which is why this first collection is called Muman Khan, uh, added to this uh, koan a commentary and a verse, a poem. So here's the commentary. If you are enlightened in the truth of this koan, you will know that coming out of one husk and getting into another is like travelers putting up in hotels. In case you are not yet enlightened, do not rush about blindly. When suddenly earth, air, fire, and water are decomposed, you will be like a crab fallen into boiling water, struggling with its seven arms and eight legs. Do not say then that I have not warned you. Here's Muman's verse. Ever the same, the moon among the clouds, different from each other, the mountain and the valley. All are blessed all are blessed. Is this one or two? This is a very short con. Some of them are lengthy and often they involve uh, a conversation between two or more people. This is just Goso making a statement to his Sangha and uh, so it's very short. Although it is short, it's considered what's known as a nanto koan. Uh, there are uh, several koans, that, maybe a dozen or so, that are known as nanto koans. These are koans that are hard to pass through so that generations of students, when they came to these koans in their koan study, got stuck here. So there's only one character in this koan. It's Goso. Uh, Goso is Master Hoenn. He is called Goso because he lived on Mount Goso. Many of the teachers are named after the mountain on which they lived. He was enlightened at age 35. This is considered to be a very tender age in Buddhism. Uh, you know, usually it takes years for people to break through, so not so many do it young. We do have an occasional Zen genius who passes through at age 19 or something like that, but 35 is considered pretty good. Uh, Goso taught for about 40 years. He had many, many students. His most famous student was Engo, also known in Chinese as Sechu. And uh, he, Engo is famous because he is the collector of the koans in another koan book called the Blue Cliff Record. Um, and he was the writer of the verses for those koans. Engo, that is. So it, the most interesting thing about Goso, uh, because it's very different from many other teachers, I think, 
is that uh, he was a scholar. He translated many um, sutras uh, from uh, Indian languages. Um, at one point in his life, he traveled to India, not so easy in those days, and supposedly he brought back 657 scriptures back to China. You know, China had a long history of Buddhism before Bodhidharma ever showed up there with Zazen, but their, their, uh, their Buddhist uh, practice at that point was mostly you know, reading the sutras and uh, chanting and, uh, you know, uh, some kind of practice that did not include meditation. So, uh, these, uh, by Goso's time, they did have meditation. He's a Zen teacher, but uh, these, these scriptures uh, remained important, just as it was very important in uh, English-speaking countries when the sutras were translated for the first time into English. Uh, this was equally important for the Chinese students. Uh, Goso lived to be 80 years old, we're told, and supposedly he predicted his death. He, he announced he was going to retire from teaching. He took a bath, shaved his head, and the next day he died. Uh, we don't know if this is apocryphal or true. Many Zen teachers are said to be able to predict their, their, their death. Often it would involve the writing of a death poem before they went. You know, you don't have to be a Zen teacher to know your end is near, but um, perhaps they had a special tuned inness to that. So this story of Sanjo uh, in the koan uh, comes from a Chinese folk tale. Uh, this folk tale uh, comes from the time of the Tang Dynasty. And I'm going to tell you the story of this, of this folk tale. It seems that there were, was a very beautiful uh, little girl and a very handsome little boy. And they uh, were playmates. They were very close. They loved each other very much. And since they were always together, um, Sanjo's father told her that when they grew up, she and Ocho would be married. Uh, so they grew up assuming that they would marry each other. And uh, then when uh, Senjo came of age to be married, her father selected another groom for her. And uh, so conflict ensued. Uh, Ocho was very upset. He decided to leave uh, the village where they were. He got in a boat and started rowing down the river. And uh, uh, Senjo was equally upset, so she didn't know what to do. Uh, she ended up uh, leaving her father's house and running along the side of the river, hailing uh, Ochu, and uh, she finally got into the boat and off they went together. Uh, they lived together for many years in another village and had two children together. Uh, at a certain point, as the children were growing up, uh, you know, sometimes having children of your own helps you to reevaluate your relationship with your own parents. So, um, Senjo began to think of, you know, her happy life with her father and how much he had loved her and that they had parted in a way that wasn't, uh, didn't give closure. So, she said to Ochu, Let, why don't we go back to our old village and I'll, I'll seek forgiveness from my father. So off they went again in this little boat, and uh, as they pull up to the village, uh, Senjo remains in the boat, and Ochu runs up to knock on the door of her father just to kind of test the waters, I guess. And uh, he said, he says to the father, um, "I have uh, Senjo in the boat. She wants to come and uh, and uh, seek your forgiveness." And the father says, what? Senjo in the boat? Ever since you left, Senjo has been right here in my house. And she's been very ill and has been confined to her bed all this time. 
So at that moment, Senjo comes up from the boat, and as she comes to the door, the uh, Senjo who has been ill and remained at home, and the, uh, the Senjo who has <coughs> run off, meld together and become one. And that's the story. So, the story and the koan use the word soul. Senjo and her soul are separated. Uh, this usage would not be anything that uh, close to what Christians mean when they talk about soul. For a traditional Christian, soul would be a permanent essence that survives death. Uh, but Buddhism explicitly denies any kind of essence, any kind of permanent thing about the self. So for Zen purposes, uh, what this koan is getting at uh, is a little clearer perhaps if we substitute the word self for soul. Uh, then the question would be, Senjo is separated from herself. Where can we find or where can she find her real self? Senjo is separated from herself. Where can she find her real self? So keeping this slightly different version of the question in mind, Let's take a look at this material here. Go so ask a student. Senjo and her soul are separated. Which is the real Senjo? I'm using here, when I say Senjo, I'm using the Japanese version of her name. This koan is also sometimes says Seijo. Seijo and her soul are, that's the Chinese version. So this koan makes no sense if you don't know the story, which is why I told it to you. So given the information that the story provides, um, we see that Goso is asking about the Senjo who stayed home with her father and the Senjo um, who ran away with Ochu. And Goso asks, which one is the real one? So this koan, like many, many koans, uh, immediately seeks to lead us astray because it sets up a choice, uh, a dualistic choice between one or the other, between the daughter and the wife. And it tries to point us to a dualistic view of the self, as though there could be two different selves. This is an absolutely false choice, because what Buddha saw when he was enlightened is that there was no self, much less two different selves. So from this point of view, both selves would be empty, and neither would be real. If real in the sense of a solid, always the same self. It's not that we don't have a self in some sense. It's that it's not what we think it is. So at this point, I want to leave the koan and turn to the uh, commentary and the verse. We'll come back to the koan later. So here's the commentary again. If you are enlightened in the truth of this koan, you will know that coming out of one husk and getting into another is like travelers putting up in, a ho in hotels. In case you are not yet enlightened, do not rush about blindly when suddenly earth, air, fire, and water are decomposed, you will be like a crab fallen into boiling water, struggling with its seven arms and eight legs. Do not say then that I have not warned you. So this first line, if you are enlightened in the truth of this koan, you will know that coming out of one husk and getting into another is like travelers putting up in hotels. So Mumon here is using a metaphor of a hotel guest, and he uses this to describe how there might appear to be 
different selves in different periods of time. He says that these different versions of us are like the different hotel rooms that we enter and leave at different times and places. But the question we need to answer is, who is it that enters and leaves? What is it? Where is this self that's not the same from moment to moment? A deep look at the meaning of the koan suggests that the self is each changing moment and that it has no permanent existence apart from the circumstances of each time and place where we find ourselves. One commentator to this koan says this, each moment is vividly present, but when it is gone, it is gone. Our experience streams along moment after moment. Beyond this coming and going of each moment, there is nothing permanent. So what he's saying here is no permanent, unchanging self. This hotel metaphor also points to the larger question of life and death. Death is sometimes described as leaving one husk and passing into another. Life is the husk we leave upon our death. But what is the husk of death? What is it that dies? Is there anything that does not die? If you think that you have a permanent self, then you're going to cling to that self. You're going to try and defend it, protect it, and get a lot of stuff for it. And we, we can see in our, in our own cultures a very widespread denial of death. On the other hand, to be realized, to be enlightened, is intimately concerned with seeing through this delusion of self. Thus the commentary begins by saying, if you are enlightened in the truth of this koan, then you will have seen through the delusion of self. And you will accept the coming and going of life and death. But then Mumun presents the opposite case, if you, in case you are not yet enlightened. He says, do not rush about blindly. Not a good practice standard, rushing about blindly. He notes the likelihood that you will be panicked at the time of death if you have not yet seen through the self. Next he says, when suddenly earth, air, fire, and water are decomposed, you will be like a crab fallen into boiling water, struggling with its seven arms and eight legs. So here he's describing the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. This is, these are the four uh, substances that the uh, ancients thought composed the entire universe, just in, in the same way that we think it's atoms and molecules and that kind of thing. This was their version of what's there underneath the surface. They thought these were the building blocks of all things and that they made up the entire universe one way or another. And uh, it's interesting to note that our Zen altar reflects all of these things. Earth is reflected in the flowers. Air is reflected in the smoke that goes up from the incense. Fire is the candles. And we always have a little cup of water on our altar. So basically what the Zen altar is saying is, Nothing is left out of this practice. It's all here. There's nothing that is outside your practice, nothing that is outside yourself. So Moomin uh, says that those who cling to a self will be like a crab fallen into boiling water, struggling with its seven arms and eight legs. At the point of death, he says, you will enter into a state of terror. This is a pretty uh, vivid metaphor that he uses here. 
a pretty horrifying image, like a crab struggling in boiling water. Finally, in the last line of his commentary, he says, Do not say then that I have not warned you. Here what Mumon is doing, he's trying to validate the teachings of Goso and his own teachings uh, in the commentary in the verse. He reminds us to take care of the great matter. The great matter in Zen is the matter of life and death. He wants us to do this while we still have time and not to wait until we're faced with the immediacy of death. So after his commentary, he presents a verse, ever the same, the moon among the clouds, different from each other, the mountain and the valley. All are blessed, all are blessed. Is this one or two? So the first line, he says, ever the same, the moon among the clouds. The absolute reality of the moon, he's saying, is always the same, whether we can see it clearly or whether it's hidden by the clouds. It's always the same moon, whatever phase it's in, from the little sickle moon to the beautiful full moon. And furthermore, the reality of cloud and moon are the same as well from the absolute point of view. No matter how different they may appear from each other, their basic nature is the same. So this this line also describes the reality of self. The reality of self is always the same, whether we see it in the form of young or old, male or female, you or me. No matter how different you and I might appear, In relative terms, our basic reality is always the same. What is that basic reality? Buddha nature, we call it in Buddhism. So this is the absolute way of looking at things, the way of emptiness of looking at things. The second line of the verse presents the relative view. He says, different from each other, the mountain and the valley. So mountains and valleys are clearly different from each other, right? One is high, one is low. So that's the relative way. You and I are not the same thing from that point of view. But we can also look at mountains and valleys from the point of view of the absolute. Though they are different, mountains and valleys are part of the same one whole earth. They're inseparable from each other. You can't have a valley without a mountain. You can't have a mountain without a valley. In Buddhist language, we would say they are codependent. The existence of one depends on the existence of the other. And in this sense, mountains and valleys are not different at all. The final line of the poem says, all are blessed, all are blessed. Is this one or two? So Mumon is saying here, everything is holy. Everything is perfect, just as it is, including us. We can look at things from the absolute or the relative point of view. They are one, they are different. Each way of seeing is true. Each of us is perfect just the way we are. That's the absolute point of view. And each of us could use a little improvement. That's the relative point of view. <clears throat> we know when we <coughs> we know when we look at things from the point of view of the net of Indra that everything is co- connected. I think you probably all know the net of Indra. It's, it's, it's a metaphor for how a Buddhism sees the universe. It's this vast net, and where each of the strands of the net cross, there's a diamond. And this diamond is highly polished and reflective, and so each diamond on the net reflects every other 
a diamond on the net, and they're all connected in this large entity. <coughs> so that no matter how separate the diamonds on the net may appear, if we take a larger view, all these diamonds are part of one great whole. So nothing is separate, nothing can stand alone. But this is where Buddhism gets the all as one uh, that so many Buddhist students get stuck on. So now let's go back to the koan. <coughs> Goso asked a student, Senjo and her soul are separated, which is the real Senjo. So if we look at Senjo from the point of view of the net of Indra, uh, this vision of connectedness and wholeness tells us that no matter how Senjo <clears throat> how separate the Senjo who stayed behind and the Senjo who fled seem. They are one. So Senjo's subjective situation, how she feels and how, how looking on, she seems to be separate. This reflects our own sense of separation. It reflects the splitting off that we do. We split from some of our feelings and experiences. Uh, and this, ref this gives us a sense of alienation from ourselves, from others, from our life itself. Is that sense of self we have subjectively from the flow of our thoughts and feelings? Is that self separate from the self that seems to observe this flow? Is the self that is sincere and kind, <coughs> excuse me, creative and smart, is this the same self that is also cruel and ignorant, tight and angry? Because some emotions and traits and actions and experiences in our lives feel too fearful and shameful to experience, so we don't open ourselves up to them. We tuck them away. We shift them aside. We try to hide them. And this is known as our shadow side, the side we don't like to acknowledge to ourselves, and we especially don't want to show to others. But what happens is that ordinarily we enter Zen practice thinking that uh, it will help us to get rid of this side that we don't like. But what actually happens in the course of practice is that this shadow side comes forward. It comes up. We sit Zazen. There's nothing to do. You know, I mean, you guys can at least look out the window, but in my Zen doesn't look at a white wall. So, <laughs> you know... There's no entertainment, so you're sitting with yourself quietly, which is why we avoid being alone and being quiet. And we're always trying to keep ourselves busy and entertained. Because when we sit quietly with ourselves, stuff comes up. We can't hide it. We can't escape it. So we, we have only a couple of choices when that happens, and uh, some people flee Zen practice at that point. And the other, the other uh, option is come to terms with it, and those are the people who stay. So like the two sides of Senjo, all our feelings and experiences are us. Like Senjo, we are whole. Everything on, in our lives arises co-dependently in connection with everything else. This is the term that Buddhism uses, co-dependent. It just means that everything happens at once and nothing can happen without all the other things that are happening because they're all connected. So there's no way that we can separate ourselves or parts of our lives. No way we can split off the way that Senjo tried to do. If you recall the story, she disobeyed her father, and she ran from her loving home to marry Ochu. No doubt she felt guilty, 
and like a bad daughter, you know, this, uh, uh, this could happen today, but you have to realize that the society that she was in had a lot more strong societal pressures to be a dutiful daughter. So she felt a great deal of guilt. She also ran off with Ochu, un unchaperoned and unmarried. This would also have been taboo in her society. She was pulled by her sexual love for him, and so she may have had a good deal of sexual guilt as well. And she may have been very angry at her father because it looks like a betrayal. He had told them as children that they would be married, and then he selected someone else for her. So you can see how a lot of guilt and anger might have built up in Senjo. You can also see why she might not have wanted to acknowledge all these things. So Senjo, on the one hand, had the courage to pursue her own desires. But perhaps part of her could not make a clean break. Part of her had to remain an obedient young girl and stay behind with her father. Yet there was also the part of her that grew up, embraced her sexual nature, became a wife and a mother, and was very happy in these roles. But she was unable to put these two parts of herself together. The truth is, they could never be truly separated, but she tried. <clears throat> her true maturity came when she was able to reevaluate her feelings toward her father. She felt their past love. She embraced the possibility that he might forgive her. It was only uh, in seeking and receiving her father's pardon that she was able to forgive herself. And that perhaps was what cleared the way for her to merge the two parts of herself together. So Senjo and her soul were no longer separated. Her shadow side was one with the rest. But what about us? We too are always one. You are the worst thing you ever did, and you are the best thing you ever did. To live is to be one particular aspect of your real self in each moment. To die is to be one particular form of your real self at one particular moment. What to do? Plunge directly into life and death plunge directly into your experience. It is only in the moment that we encounter our real self. It is only in the moment that we escape separation. So which is the real Senjo? And an even more important question, which is the real you? One of the commentaries on, commentators on this koan says, first, Discover your own true self. Then you can see which is the real Senjo. And I say exactly right. First, discover your own true self. So I, I give this talk partly because it uh, coordinates with the film that we're going to see. Uh, in this film, you see a heroine. Um, not at all like Senjo in some ways, but very like her in others. Uh, you see a heroine who split two different selves, two different ways of being, and she has trouble bringing them together. So uh, keep the, keep the, these, uh, the comments on this colon in mind uh, when, when you see the film. And notice how this heroine does it. How does she bring together all these two selves, which seem so different? <clears throat>